who knows me. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I just wanted to, I mean, I didn't want to. Oh, I'm the introduction. Oh, well, I guess he doesn't know me very well. No, but okay. the introduction is just for. Okay, okay. It's just for you, I guess. Is it the Since you prepare it. I am here, Brian. <laughs> okay, I guess. Um, good afternoon, again, welcome back. My name is again, Leslie Ali, and I'm here to introduce our second speaker, and his name is Brian Bissell. He was a professor in linguistics and life skills in Korea for 10 years, and studies many ways that science, science confirms God's truths. In his free time, he loves sharing God's truths to free, to free people and jumping off waterfalls with friends. And the topic he'll be speaking on is economics, creation economics, a crucial solution for world problems and finishing God's work. May you be blessed by his presentation. Thank you to Leslie Ali. Appreciate you helping out in this way. And many others also have helped us in many ways in this uh, conference here. Um, I don't know, were you at High Point before? Pardon? Were you at High Point this morning? No, I wasn't. Okay, well, I'll just give you a little background on what happened here. Um, the Bible says, of course, in 2 Peter 3, that there's going to be a very specific denial of creation in the flood. And it predicts that at the same time, 2 Timothy 3, all, sorry, see, 2 Peter 3 says, in the last days there will be deceptions and deliberate denial of creation and flood. 2 Timothy 3 says there's going to be great difficulties, terrible times because of greed and all selfishness and pride and those kind of things. So those are connected very closely. And then about uh, two months ago, I saw a research study, and it said that when people don't know the evidence for creation, it's now the number one reason why they give a faith in God. But if they know reason, if they know the evidence for creation, then they're stronger than they believe in God. And at the same time, uh, many theologians have said that creation is the foundation for every major doctrine. If there's a doctrine in economics in the Bible, then that's a connection to creation also somehow. So. I've been studying that, and I'll share some things about that today uh, as we look here. Um, let's uh, have a little word of prayer before we start here, okay? So oh, is Derek is here? He's here. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll pray, and we'll, hopefully, hopefully he'll come. Uh, dear Father Heaven, thank you very much for this day, that we can focus our minds on our Creator and His wonderful promises and also truths of many kinds that help us, help us to beat every challenge and deception in the world. Thank you each, uh, for each person here, and their love for you may go stronger and hopefully we can learn some solutions for the challenges that we face and also friends face and maybe our cultures or different countries we come from face and where we go to serve God in different countries. The whole world needs to know about these truths of God that you talk about and so we pray that you'll be with us as we, as we talk about this a little bit and also a dialogue uh, about your insights and your wisdom that's unmatched in creation and economics. I pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, well, this morning, I just a very brief summary this morning, I talked about how there's 2,000 verses in the Bible on economics. And the Bible says that God gives us the ability to gain wealth. Um, if all sin is evil, as the Bible says many times, and then all evil is rooted in greed, then all evil has some kind of economic connection. When we sin, we're going to be losing money of some kind, or losing resources of some kind. So that's a major, so all sin comes, goes back to someone's greed. It could be politicians' greed, uh, corporations, government, Satan, maybe your, someone, some individuals. So all, all sin has economic connections. We talked a little bit about how some habits, the brain habit, the, the creation habits of health. Um, these are, so let's see, right there, okay. Um, that's fine. So we talked about how there are many, all the new start habits of the, the health habits and the creation, they have a major impact on the brain, and you can actually get about 100% higher grades according to many scientists. I did a two hour presentation on this at a high point a few, a couple, a year or two ago. So you can, if you compare people who don't follow creation and health principles, and trusting God and things like that, and those who do, it can be up to 100% difference in grades, uh, they say. So like if someone has like a 40% average, it could be up to 80%. So Pretty powerful, and also, if you for every A or B of in college, it's going to be about forty-two thousand dollars during your life, according to science. So that's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, for health, 
principles alone, if you follow your health principles, you don't have to go to the hospital so much. <laughs> so that saves you money. And the, the, the MIT professor, he said it doubles your money by your 50s. Pretty powerful. Uh, that marriage, of course, is started in creation. And the people say, um, the research says that if you are married, that you have 93% higher wealth than singles do. <laughs> So that's also an economic connection. <laughs> uh, married, because you, if you're if you're married, like if you're single, you have to buy two. Like if there's two singles, you have to buy like two houses, two cars, two stoves, two refrigerators like that. If you're married, you can share, <laughs> and you don't need as much sometimes. So there's an economic aspect there too. If you get, I didn't put it here, but if people get divorced, um, they can lose between five hundred thousand and a million dollars over their lifetime because of divorce. One of my friends talked about that, and he said, yeah, that's real, that happened to me. So lots of different things there. Uh, another one <clears throat> is that uh, the Samaritan says that Christians just in America contribute $1.2 trillion to the economy. Pretty powerful. Um, <clears throat> so that's very good. Uh, no, where did, God, where did God put Adam and Eve? In a garden, right? Okay. We'll talk about this a little this morning. We'll go a little deeper today, or this evening here. So he, he put them in the garden, of course, that's in Genesis 2 8. And the Bible says, when people have when, when have, when they have their own home and garden, there's peace and safety throughout the land. This was in Solomon's time. But many times in Israel's history, when they, when they had their own homes and gardens, when every family had that, then they had peace and safety and security throughout the land. So it was very, very, that's a, and many, many hundreds of economists. They say, if you want to stay free, if you want to have a good economy, if you want to thrive, you need to divide the land equally, and or at least fairly, fair, somewhat fairly. And in the Bible, you see many times that God said, you've got to divide the land fairly. You see it in Numbers 13 to 18. You see it in um, uh, Ezekiel when they come back from exiles, Ezekiel 45 and 47. You see it in um, Nehemiah 5. You see it in several places in the Bible, actually. So he says this is a key issue for making the nation stable. Also Levit Leviticus uh, 25, is it 25? Yeah, 25 I think it is. It says if you follow God's principles, then you will be stable and thriving in your nation. So that's a very powerful principle. Um, this is one from Ezekiel 47. It says this is after the exile. They came back and the, one of the first things God told them, he said, Distribute the land as an allotment for yourselves and for the foreigners who have joined you and are raising their families among you. This is extremely radical, <laughs> far more than any other economist these days, to share land with everybody, even foreigners. That is just really, really radical. And the Bible is a radical book. Um, but uh, can you guess how much the value of land is these days around the world? Just take a wild, take a wild guess. What's the value of land around the world? Like, if, if, you, if you owned all the land around the world, how much value would that have? Five, take a guess, five, what? Five, five trillion. What? Five trillion. Five trillion? That's a good guess, but yeah. higher. Try to be higher. Oh, wow. Ten trillion? Uh, much higher. Twenty? Much higher. A hundred trillion? Higher? You're about halfway there. Trillion. It's about a little lower. <laughs> Four hundred. I mean, it's a, it's, uh, it's between one hundred and five hundred. Three hundred. It's about two seventeen. Okay. Wow. Uh, at least last time I checked, the value of land is two hundred seventeen trillion, <coughs> and in most countries, it's monopolized by a very few people. Okay. And when you own land, then you can rent it out to everyone else, mm -hmm. and then the about about people pay about forty to seventy percent of the income in rent. <laughs> And then that keeps a few people very rich and most everyone else poor. Mm -hmm. And there's also other things together that, that we'll look at a little more later as well. But that's one thing. So this is why one guy said, one guy, Jeff Lockton, he goes from country to country uh, making deserts into gardens, into farms, and things like that. He, he has helped people raise their economic standards by about five times with uh, growing their own food in their gardens like that. So it's really, he says, you can solve all the world's problems in a garden. Was Jesus an economic, did Jesus care about economics? Yes, he did. His first sermon, he said, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to who? The poor. The poor. That's economics, okay? 
and he sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners. They're also usually poor. <laughs> and to set the oppressed free, okay? And to proclaim a year of Jubilee. What was the year of Jubilee? Do you know what that was at all? What happened at the year of Jubilee? Have you heard about that at all? The, the 50th year. Yes. Uh, what happened then? The land, the land was all set aside. The land was rested. was returned to the original family. And also every seven years, another jubilee, they set prisoners free, or slaves free, like that. Okay, if someone sold them as a slave, they would set them free. So that's also very important. And also debts are... And debts are canceled, Deuteronomy 15.1. Yes, that's very true also. So yes. Uh, so there's a very wonderful year of freedom. They blew the horn, and it was a wonderful celebration uh, that they had then. And uh, Ellen White talks about that also, that it's important for us to follow people like that. So, um, anyway, so Jesus was actually involved in economics. There's a major economist, Dr. Michael Hudson. He says Jesus was an economic activist. He also, as you see the picture there, I don't know if you can see it, but he also cleaned the cleansed the temple not once but twice. And why? Why did he cleanse the temple? Because they abused uh, of them. They were making money. Yes. Oh, he said, you made my father's house a den of thieves, yes. stealing people's money, okay? And so he cleansed the temple twice because of economic reasons, also spiritual too. That's not, they're, they're very closely connected, of course. So um, he wanted people to be able to worship God in the temple, but also they were, you doing money changing, and the, the Pharisees actually, I didn't put this here, but the Pharisees were, at, like the Bible says, cancel debts. The Pharisees had made a document saying, if we lend you money, you will not cancel your debt. And Jesus says, we must forgive our debts, which is not just sins, it's also the economic thing as well. This is a major Christian economist, Michael Hudson, who talks about this, and he's written like 700 pages in one book alone. So anyway, but um, when there is greed, Rampant, that is a cause of every evil the Bible says. And if you trace it back far enough, every evil you can think of goes back to greed. And I have a website that's actually that shows from, from science this problem. But um, this was a, a campaign actually that I was part of uh, not too long, um, several years, about 20 years ago or so. And they realized that poverty is killing people every minute, every second. People are dying because of poverty. And it's pretty shocking and pretty terrible there, of course. It's all, poverty is also a cause of terrorism. Many people say it's religion, religion. No, it's not. That's a minor factor, if anything, because almost like one researcher, he said he interviewed the terrorists, and most of them didn't know anything about, ter about, the, uh, about the Bible or the Quran or anything like that. They were just really desperate people, and they listened to some guru who said, hey, your enemies over there, we've got to kill them. And so, the poverty was the main factor. You don't see terrorists from countries that are well off. It's mostly from those that are poor, okay? So that's another issue there. Um, this is another guy here. I have a video. If you can watch the video, it's very powerful. It's on TED Talks. Kola Masha, how farming can employ a good young workforce and build peace. Um, he says that when 20 million people entered the job market in Nigeria, and many couldn't get jobs, that led to three terrorist movements. <laughs> And so he developed a method to teach gardening and farming and things like that in ways that were paying, making them, helping them earn more money than in the cities, city jobs, four to, times, four to five times more than a city job would pay. And in this way, he probably stopped at least one or maybe two revolutions because of this um, effort like that. So, uh, very powerful. These days, we have the, the Bible says there's going to be greed issues. And sometimes people say, oh, young people, you're just not working very hard. You're lazy. <laughs> but no, economics have changed a lot. Because um, this guy is saying, hey, I pay off all my colors and buy a house like that. Well, at your age, college was 3% of median salary. Now college costs are about five to six, seven times higher. And the, most students in the 60s could pay off college debts in maybe three or four years, sometimes less. But now it takes 10, 20 years to pay off college debts like that. So it's, uh, the economy has changed a lot, and the, the cost of homes has changed also, so it's a lot more difficult now. Um, this guy is a professor from Toronto. He says that we are facing five major crises in the world. There's world population, there's environmental disaster and poisoning, 
there's energy problems that don't have enough energy resources, and there's also worldwide diseases like our pandemic and COVID recently, and he says that people die from poverty all the time. So these things are major measures. At the same time, we have a few people who are very rich and they don't know, they, they spend money on things that are trivial and useless. So it's a really crazy gap between rich and poor that we have right now. All these are five major problems, major problems and they're going to cause instability, violence, hardship, and things of like that in the next hundred years, which is what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3. It says, um, it says, greed will cause terrible times in the last days. And so if that's what the Bible says, we should find God's principles of economics to try to oppose those and try to defeat them for our people. And he says we're on the brink of a planetary emergency because of these different things. Poverty, many people say, is a form of violence because it causes abuse and it makes children vulnerable. When parents, for example, are have to be away from home, that's a very high chance for people to be abused. It's a very so it has a lot of connection to violence and crime. Uh, another guy, our says, is part of his parents are revolutionary crime. And for now, and so right now we have ten million children who are dying of hunger and are with diseases. One every three seconds. So I have a little video here. Um, there's no sound, unfortunately, but you can see it. I'll narrate what it actually says. Uh, if I can do it here. Um, this is getting a little ahead, but uh, we'll go ahead and do it. Okay, here we go. Right here. There was a movement um, had, that happened in the 1990s. Basically, there was a professor at the University of Kiel in England named Martin Dent. And he said, we have these terrible problems in the world right now. No one's solving them. Maybe the Bible has an idea. So he began reading Leviticus and the ideas of Jubilee. He said, hey, we should cancel debts and things like that. So he got many churches working together, and they uh, made many campaigns to stop the debt. And they made, this is one, this is one of the videos that they made. Um, I'm sorry there's no sound in it, but we'll just, uh, as, I, as, you, as you see this here, snap your fingers with the guy in the, in the video also, okay? And we'll go ahead there. Child dies unnecessarily every three seconds. There's a son, a daughter, a father, and the thing is, we can stop this if we work together. So let's try to make poverty history in our day. So this was a video that went by viral. Sorry, there was no sound. Um, he told us it was going to be ready, but. So this uh, campaign happened here, and uh, so we have all kinds of decisions here about children who can't go to school because of poverty, they can't uh, live in safe places. I saw one video, one man's son was killed because they couldn't afford to move to a safe area. And so it has all kinds of effects. Um, many countries, um, sorry, because many countries pay so much money in debt repayments, they can't even afford to like make roads and housing like that. So question here, how many think, how much, rich countries give about 58 billion. How much do you think rich countries take from the poor countries? This is, the money we give is all, all in the news, but how much do they take through debt repayments and things like that? Take a guess, A, B, C, or D. Which one, how much do you think rich countries take from poor, poor countries? Like they do, they take it by, uh, Taking their resources and taking their oil and different things with, the, with different companies and things like that. And they use it through debt repayments and interest and different things. Take a guess A, B, C, or D? D and that may be low. Okay? Actually, you're right. When I first made this, um, it was $324 billion, But I saw more research recently. It actually, I need, I need to update this. It actually said it's now $2 trillion that rich countries are taking from poor countries. Um, so I need to update the slide actually. Um, so this is an example here. This is a coffee farmer. He pays. He says, "You guys pay three dollars for coffee. Well, people that pay three dollars for coffee or a cocoa like that, but I only get a couple of cents." He is the one actually making it, and he gets only a couple of cents for a three dollar cup of coffee. Crazy, okay? Uh, in Haiti, Haiti is like perfect for rice. They're awesome for growing rice. But um, what happened is that uh, rice producers they want a better life. They work hard for it. 
but then they were bombarded by cheap foreign rice. What happened is that we charge other countries major tariffs to import into our country. But America and Europe forced Haiti to reduce the tariffs to zero or like 3% or something like very low. And so we have all the machines and things, we can produce it mass production like that. The farmers in Haiti didn't have that, so we exported all our rice. Also, our government gives $1 billion subsidies to the rice farmers in America to export to Haiti. And this killed, when this happened, it killed the farmers in Haiti. Most of them went bankrupt. And then child mal mal malnourishment, malnourishment of children shot up by like 50%. And so this is one another, another economic system that's very, very shocking and causes terrible problems. The Jubilee movement was this uh, Professor Dent that I mentioned before. He basically focused on three ideas. He said the Bible says, pure and true religion is taking care of orphans and widows and their troubles and saying and not being corrupted by the world. He also thought about canceling debts every, every seven years, as Deuteronomy 15 one says. And he also said, let's make trade fair, because Amos says, hey, you should not be cheating in the marketplace. You've got to make trade fair. And there's quite a few uh, Bible verses on making trade fair in different areas. So in the verse 6 there, it says, hey, you enslave the poor for a debt of one piece of silver or gold or some sandals. And then God says, I will never forget the wicked things you do because you're cheating in the marketplace and you're measuring your own dishonest scales and there's all kinds of different dishonest trade but God is against that also. These are, the people, these are some of the people, uh, that's not right, this one. Martin Dent is the guy in the top left. He's a professor who started this and he got his ideas from the Bible. And this is something very important here because many times you see good things happening in the world, they start with God's ideas in the Bible. And this started with a Christian taking God's economics seriously. He looked at the Bible and said, hey, this is a good idea. Maybe it can solve our problems now. And then he talked to pastors. The second guy there is Pastor Rick Warren. He's with a church in California. Uh, but many of there were four hundreds of churches joined, and hundreds of NGO, NGOs joined. Last, it was the famous people like actresses and people like that, like Brad Pitt and, and people like that, okay? They were only the last part of the chain. It was the Bible that started the idea. God who helped get this idea started. Um, there were concerts and things. Uh, they had a huge campaign called Make Poverty History. And uh, so at that time, it was a child was dying every three seconds. Now, because this child, this campaign, it's now every five seconds. So it's still a problem, but they almost cut the problem in half by following God's economics. So pretty amazing. And now they have changed the name from Jubilee 2000 because 2000 is finished to. Uh, debt justice. This, this campaign is still going on. They're working in many ways to try to reduce the number of children dying from poverty and different things like that. All the different evil things. And this is, the, this is kind of interesting here. This guy is a principal of one of the colleges in Oxford. I'm not sure what a principal is. I think it's a pre like Oxford University has many, many departments and colleges like College of Biology, College of Linguistics like that. He is the president of one of the colleges. I think it would be the same thing as a chairman of the department in, our, in, our, in America. So he's a major um, economist um, in England. And he says, Jubilee 2000 saved millions of lives, he canceled billions of dollars of debt, and this idea was rooted in the Old Testament. He said, without Leviticus, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, there would be no Jubilee 2000, no debt campaign, no international pressure. The Bible idea was simple. The distribution of income and wealth have pure to be equalized to restore God's harmony every 49 years. Once that was done, foreigners would sound the Jubilee. So this was, this is, over 49 years, things get a little wrong in our kilter. Jubilee sets it right again, okay? Now, interesting here. Uh, no, 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 no. He says, Leviticus 25 makes Das Kapital the team. What's Das Kapital? Anybody know? Anybody know Das Kapital? Nobody? That's, that's German? This is German, but it was a book written by someone very famous. Uh, um, yes, uh, the Capital. Um, Marx? Marx, yes. <laughs> this is written by Marx. So, what, what this Oxford professor is saying, he's saying that. The, the Bible is much more radical than Marx. <laughs> okay, pretty, pretty funny, pretty interesting like that. And I agree, God, God has the best ideas, and 
it's radical to those who are the oppressors, not to those who are godly, of course, okay? Um, so, um, so he says it's not Morris or Keynes, these are famous economies. They don't inspire and change the world. It's Leviticus, <laughs> the Bible that changes the world, okay? And Ellen White has something similar to say. Uh, Ellen White says the provisions of the sabbatical year and the jubilee would, in a great measure, set right that which had gone wrong in the social and political economy of the nation. She's saying the same thing the Oxford professor said. <laughs> he said, this jubilee set things right. She said, this is the thing, principle of set things right. So pretty awesome. Um, and Jesus says, of course, that whatever we do to the least of these, or those you better than me. Um, so there's all kinds of ways, all kinds of economic principles in the Bible um, that can help us to uh, beat poverty and beat greed and all those kind of things, if we understand and follow them. Just a few of them. Jesus, of course, says we got to treat the least of these the same way we should treat Jesus, because he created them. So that's a very important foundation. Um, in the world, we spend one, actually it's higher than that now, it's probably like two trillion now, okay? At least two trillion dollars on military. Just 10% less, we could stop poverty all over the world. <laughs> Give everyone their basic needs if we didn't have so many wars. Problem is, war is the most profitable thing to make money quickly. You destroy things, you have to build them again, and you get money from the governments and things. It's just very profitable very quickly. So that's why you always have war. Not because of religion or greed so much, it's because of greed. This is a, a funny example. A $70 million aircraft drops a $350,000 bomb on a $10 tent. <laughs> Who's making the money? <clears throat> Who's making the money here? Military industry and several US presidents have actually said, like, I think it was Roosevelt was one of them. Oh, no, no, Eisenhower, Eisenhower. He said the military industry is one of the biggest threats to our freedom, actually, because it's costing us so much money and things like that. So, very interesting. This, uh, every time you watch a missile going off, that's more, that's like $1.5 million. <laughs> and that, uh, um, so it's like watching the highways and textbooks and teachers and salaries and Medicare checks all explode in bombs. <laughs> Okay, um, this is a little kind of interesting uh, meaning here. It says, why do we have wars? Well, because we're ruled, ruled by an elite group of psychopaths who own the banks, they control the governments, and media, they fund both sides of wars for profit, and manufacture consent through media and propaganda. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't know, modern propaganda started in America. It was designed by Americans, in America, for Americans. <laughs> Edward Bernays, he is famous as being the father of American propaganda. You can read his book, Google Edward Bernays, and you can read his book titled Propaganda. He wrote it in 1920. And he taught the elites in America how to control the masses with media and things like that. And then his ideas were borrowed by the Nazis. <laughs> then when, they, when their war stopped, he said, I'm gonna use the same ideas, but I will call them something different. He said, I'm gonna call them public relations. <laughs> okay, or marketing. So. A lot of that comes from Renee's. So, uh, this is one of the biggest, the biggest problems in the world right now. Um, there's all kinds of loopholes and things where many of the rich people actually in corporations do not pay any taxes at all. Uh, some of them pay zero, like Apple and IBM, and they find ways to pay zero taxes, while others pay a lot of things like that. So, and then they blame the people who are poor. Uh, Ron Paul, he's a um, politician you may know, he says, it's no accident that this, the century of Central banking has coincided with the, with the century of war also. Because when you can print money from, from paper, then you can fund all kinds of wars, you can make more progress that way, there's all kinds of things you can do there. But uh, Dr. Wilkinson, he gave a TED talk, he said, if we can make uh, economics more fair, we can cut, he says the connection between murder, like between economics and crime is very, very close. You could reduce murder by half. You could stop mental illness by two thirds. You could stop obesity. You could stop imprisonment by 80%. Look at that, just by making life more equal in economics like that. Keen versus reduced by 80%, and levels of trust were increased by 85%. <laughs> He's done a lot of research on this, it's pretty amazing. Um, but this land rights issue is very, very important. The Bible talks about it hundreds of times. Ellen White talks about it too. Many, many kind of talk about it many times. But they basically divided and shared land with families and tribes throughout the land of Israel, and they tried to make it equitable. 
The same idea has been advocated by many cultures and many economists as the single best way to solve problems in our world. I can't afford anyway. Unfortunately, in the 1700s, a lot of people, they tried to close, and before the 1700s, a lot of people were sharing land and using it fairly equally. Not always, but a lot more. But then at this time, they began, the, some people who were powerful and had armies or whatever, they, they began to close up land. Like, That's my land. This land pushed off the people who are owning it. And so that caused a lot of poverty. And then the 900 Act passed, and so they began to close up and close the land like that. So this was, like, the left side is before those laws. You see lots of small land and things owned by many people. After the laws, a few people owned everything, and everyone else had to borrow or rent from them. Major, major change. Oops, sorry. I'm going the wrong direction. Sorry. Okay. Now, in most countries are like this. We have, um, if, uh, like right now in America, about, uh, I think it's the top 10% own like 75% of the land that's publicly available like that. And so if you look at the wealth, this is actually how big it's a little bit, it's, um, it's worse than now. But 1% uh, of Americans own that whole section because of bribing government and things like that in, in, in different ways. 40% would just own that one dot. <laughs> so this is massive inequality. We have the worst inequality, inequality right now in our history. Just a, a month ago I read a study that said uh, the top 1% have stolen $50 trillion from the lower classes. By usually by controlling and manipulating government laws and different things, different tax rates and all kinds of different things. So that's a big issue there. But, uh, the Bible says everyone has a basic right to food and housing, medical care, and education, or that, that kind of thing, if they work, of course. Um, you look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah 5. Uh, Nehemiah, the, the families are having to sell their children as slaves. And Nehemiah goes to Rich and he says, hey, you got to sell back, give back your land to them and uh, give back all the interest you charged. Um, he said that the ones who are wealthy unjustly, unfairly, they're the ones who have, are the big cause of problem. This is not meaning that being rich is wrong. Being rich can be good if you do it ethically. Abraham was rich, Solomon was rich, so there's, there, there is ethical rich. Okay? Work hard, there's ways to be rich you know, with God's principles. But then of course, we as Christians know that this world is temporary. So we want to find ways to take care of our families first, but then see how much good we can do for others, because we want everyone as much as possible to go to heaven. So um, that is important too. So, uh, but going on here, uh, many people in history say that uh, land is important. Land monopoly ruined Rome, not once, but several times actually. Um, Lincoln said the land that God gave to man for his home and earth and sustenance should never be the possession of any one person. It should be shared between, between all of us like that, okay? Thomas Jefferson said the earth is given to us as a common stock to labor and live on. Many American pioneers said you've got to keep the land rights shared, otherwise you will lose freedom. Especially Noah Webster, he's another one I didn't around here, but he's, he was very, very clear on that also. Um, in China they said, uh, don't, um, he's talking about land rights, this is another issue I think I'll speak about right now. Um, basically, instead of, basically land tax means instead of sharing land, you will tax only land and not anything else. And that results in almost the same thing where you divide the land among many people. So it's a very similar idea. But they said this has benefited some China and many countries also. Voltaire, even atheists are saying, hey, you've got to share the land because uh, if you don't, it's going to ruin you. Okay? Um, this is another guy, you know, so another atheist. He said, you are undone. You will be, you will, you will be ruined if you forget that the earth, the land and the fruits of the earth belong to everyone. So even atheists are kind of um, taking, uh, taking what God said in the Bible many times. The many Native Americans and indigenous people, they had this idea that the land was something sacred that belonged to everyone. And this is just one person of uh, one of many Indians who say this kind of thing. Uh, the Bible says that earth is Lord's and everything in it. If it's God who made it, then he has the right to say who can share it and how it should be shared. And so that's what he did there in many places also. He said, silver gold mine. Um, he says, if I'm hungry, I wouldn't ask you because it's all mine. <laughs> so uh, many times he talked about that. But this is a study from Tech Talk uh, by Richard Wilkinson I mentioned before. Uh, he is saying that whenever you see land more equally distributed, then you see these countries thriving and growing more and more su successful. And it's interesting, there's a Bible verse in Proverbs 14.34. It says, um, righteousness makes nations great. 
Okay? But the word for righteous there is a Hebrew word, tzedakah. And have you heard of tzedakah before, anybody? Okay? That word is also translated as justice. And many times in the Bible, God said, do justice and your nation will be great. It will thrive, it will grow. You'll have um, plenty of cattle and you'll have many babies and children and uh, there'll be peace in your nation. And many times it said that in the Bible. So um, I actually have a website that's with listing all sorts of Bible verses on land rights and issues there. So, um, and, and many economists have said this is happening in country to country. In Taiwan, when they share land rights with some, within a year or two, they had 10% higher GDP. In Korea, it worked in Japan and Hong Kong, it all worked in California, yes. At least 30 other places we know about, it worked very well to make the nation strong and thriving. I'm going to tell you about Korea a little bit here in just a second. Uh, but this is China's great, China's great way. This, this happened a thousand years before Confucius. And he said, when the great way prevailed, natural resources were fully used for the benefit of all. Not one, not two, not a few, but all, okay? And this way, evil schemes were repressed, robbers and thieves and other lawless elements failed to arise. People didn't even have to shut their outdoor door, their, their doors. This was the great age of peace and prosperity, famous in Chinese history for being the greatest time of peace and prosperity. So now a little bit from Korea. I was in Korea for 23 years. I went there as a missionary, a student missionary to teach language and things like that. Bible as well. And this is a, just a little bit, very brief thing about Korea's history and how they change. On the left, you can see this is Gangnam. That's actually a part of Seoul. Uh, the, this is now the this is now the richest, one of the richest parts in all of Korea. Okay. In 1950s, there it was like <coughs> a dirt road. Okay. And Korea was the poorest country in the world. Well, first or second poorest country in the world. One and two. Okay. Uh, within 50, 60 years. It has gone from the poorest nation to top 15 GDP. And you can see this was my hometown. This is where I lived, actually. I lived, where did I live? Uh, I live in the far side, far right side of that bridge, uh, actually. So it has done, it's gone through massive development in just a few decades. And I, also, interestingly, the crime rate in Korea is four times less than America. And there's many reasons for that, but um, big reasons. They had a major Christian revival in the early 1900s. And they confessed their sins, they reconciled, and they said, hey, we're all brothers and sisters under Jesus. Major, that was the first foundation. Second, they said, if we're all brothers and sisters, then everyone deserves justice and equal rights, equal chances to have a good life and a good chance to live life and do good for God, okay? And so their churches, um, let's see, um, sorry, this guy here, okay? Kim Yong-gi, he was a Christian. His parents became Christians because of missionaries who healed, who gave them good medicine and healed them uh, from diseases. He wanted his country to be free. He said, because the Japanese kept on invading and other Chinese invaded, different, 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 different countries invaded. So he said, I want my nation to be free. I'm going to go to China and become the emperor of China. He tried, but he failed. <laughs> and a pastor in China heard his idea. I said, hey, you're not Chinese. How can you become Chinese emperor? <laughs> so he said, go back to China, go back to Korea, make your country strong, then nobody will attack you. So that's ah, probably a good idea. So he went back to Korea and he thought, how can I make my number my country strong? And he was reading through the Bible, and he noticed again and again and again. They're talking about growing your own food. You have most of the prophets were growing their own food, or they were um, they were doing they were raising sheep or something like that. And they were they were in tune, they were connected to the land somehow. And so he began doing that. He would buy some property and then develop it and sell it to church members. Buy something, develop, develop a couple of years, sell it to church members. He did that over and over and over again until most of the churches in the area, they had, every family had their own land. And these were the star thriving places in Korea. And the president of Korea came to his place and said, wow, this is an amazing idea. Let's scale this up. And so they did. And, the, and Korea actually made a law. They said, you cannot own more than three hectares of land. Hectares, something like an acre, I think, like that. So he is limiting land ownership, which is what Jubilee did. And they also had training schools. And they called it now, they called it the um, Sengal Lundong, which is the new village movement. But it came from Kim Yong-gi 
and he made the Canaan farm movement. You can see this on, if you Google, you can see a little bit about this in certain places, but they came from the Bible's ideas of economics and sharing, and there's about 20 different ideas that this, this caused, uh, that he used, but I'll tell you in a second here. But in, interestingly, it's not just economics. Korea went from 1% to 30% Christian during that time, when they were following Bible economics. And that is the second biggest evangelism explosion in history that we know about. The first is in China. But, um, is that ready there, sir? Okay, where is this? Um, sorry. Oh, I'm going backwards. Sorry, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. Okay, so there's a little chart here I'm going to show you. He had like 20 ideas he used. This one, this one here, right here. So he had 20 ideas here. Focusing on resources and recycling and careful wasteland, stop the burning rice and things like that, save food, save energy, working hard or studying hard, everyone's working, no one's lazy, um, social behavior, dress simply, live simply, uh, and uh, restore dignity, respect everyone, patriotism, stop corruption, health. I think he was connected to SDAs, I'm pretty sure I found a connection there, uh, but they, he, he said don't drink alcohol, don't smoke, and also um, don't litter and have a wide, a wide diversified diets, uh, fight alcoholism, like that, and also worship, family worship, personal prayer, and uh, community worship like that, resolve conflicts, fight witchcraft. So these are the main major principles along with the land rights that he followed, and these all were crucial for helping Korea go from the bottom to the top, economically, and also in mission areas. In Christian areas, they were a missionary receiving country, now they're in the top five missionary sending countries. And some of my friends in Korea have gone to Korea, Mongolia, Taiwan, Nigeria, Ghana. As, just from my one church in Korea, they went to all those countries as, as missionaries. <laughs> so pretty amazing. Um, so, okay, I'm going to skip a little bit uh, to one, one last thing here. I'm going to get right there. Skip. Oh, I'm going backwards again, sorry. I'm back there, sorry about that. Okay, let's go over here. Sorry. I have one last section, which is a very new thing. This, um, this uh, I forgot to say this, this uh, Make Property History campaign, that was very, very good. It canceled a hundred billion dollars of debt, and it helped in many ways. Uh, they helped me children to go to school, and they built roads, they stopped malaria deaths, um, they doubled the age of 50 billion like that. Um, they, had, they gave millions of people chances to learn, and um, just a whole bunch of things. They lifted 1.3 billion people out of poverty. <laughs> by this main property history campaign. Um, this, is Millenn this actually became the Millennium Development Goals and Melinda Gates. I don't agree with all the Gates things does do sometimes, but this came from the Bible and they talked about it. She said that um, 1.3 billion of this in the poverty in the last 100 years, but she didn't mention that it came from this main property history movement, which came from the Bible. <laughs> Again, you don't see the origin of the New Times because they're censoring it. Um, Ellen White says something very powerful and very important. She says, the standard of the golden rule is the true standard of Christianity. Anything short is a deception. Of the apostolic church, it's written that no man said that any of the things he possessed was his own, and there were no needy people among them. The apostles testified of the resurrection, and God's great blessing was upon them. They worshiped together, they met in homes, they shared meals with great joy and generosity, praised God, and joined the goodwill of all people, God added to them day by day those who are being saved. This is a key thing she says, is important, and she says also, we need to copy that example. She says, when those who profess the name of Christ will practice the principles of the golden rule in that context, the same power will attend the gospel as in early times, in apostolic times. So there's very important principles here that we need to understand better. Uh, last is this, um, I have made an acronym, we have the New Start acronym for health. I've made an acronym for economics now. This is the first time anybody has seen it. You are the first ones <laughs> yeah, who have seen it full, okay? So the first one, L is for love God and all people. Mark 12 says that, he says that's one of his top principles, okay? And then O is for own your own home. Find ways to own your own home. And there's all kinds of ways here to do that with God's economics. Um, volunteer. And God says always be helping, looking for people to help, and always do good to all people uh, like that, so that's important. 
And vote for leaders who follow God's principles. That's actually in Deuteronomy 17. It says, don't vote for anyone, don't vote for anyone who's greedy, uh, promiscuous, or ignorant of God's laws, because if they betray their family and friends, they'll betray a whole nation. So, so very important there. Um, e is for education from God for everyone. Uh, God's principles are the foundation of knowledge. And wisdom begins. The Bible says that all of God is the beginning of wisdom. So get a godly education. That's another important principle. It is very valuable. We talked about how much that is valuable to you before. Um, and then also, 90% of Nobel Prizes have been won by Jews and Christians. So God's education makes a big difference in how far you can progress in useful areas. Uh, mission. M is for mission and Mary and media and money. So funny. Be a missionary. Invest in missions whenever you can. Stay married. We talked about it before. That's important. Uh, media focus on truth. So don't spend time with fiction. Focus your mind on what's true. That will help you to be much more successful and to make a lot more innovations and advances to solve problems. And use money as a tool, but not your slave master. <laughs> money is money is useful. Ellen White says this. The Bible says it. Okay. But don't let it be the number one goal to get rich. You've got to use the money for higher purposes than that. Uh, on missions, Dr. Woodbury completed a major, huge study, and he said that missions are the number one factor in bringing democracy and freedom to all the countries around the world. And he said that uh, it's responsible for more than 50% of democracy, printing, education, economic development, civil society, private property, rule of law, corruption, and reducing corruption. And his research was online at Harvard, now they moved it off there, it's, but it's still online, okay, you can find it. Um, he says in the Congo, both French and Belgian colonists and forced villagers to get rubber from the jungle. If they didn't, they burned down villages, cut up hands and feet, and did other horrible things. In the French Congo, no justice was done, and it wasn't even news. What, but in the Belgian Congo, a huge protest started. Can you guess the reason? What's the difference? In one country, there was injustice. And lots of protests. Other country, there's injustice, but no pro protest. What was the difference? Any guess? Missionary. What? Missionary. The missionaries. The missionaries were in the Belgian Congo. Okay? Like John and Alice Harris, they took photographs, they sent it to back to America, the churches, and they began writing to their leaders like that, and it began to be in the news. So because of missionaries, that became known, and then America put pressure on Congo to stop the injustice. In the French, no missions were there, they weren't allowed, and so no news got out and nobody talked about it. Okay? Missionaries made a difference. Um, and also, they, the missionaries thought, hey, if, they, if everyone's equal, then they have the same right to know about God that we do. We've got to teach them how to read, to study the Bible, so they can know about God and learn about Him themselves. That's good. And so they focus on reading a lot. And if you look at worldwide, worldwide poverty, literacy is the main thing that helps you rise out of poverty. It helps you to educate yourself if you have time, okay? It's a huge issue there, okay? Unless you have broadband literacy, you can't have democracy, okay? So it's really important. Um, we'll very also talk about the printing presses and things like that, but uh, it was only when the, the Protestant missionaries arrived that they began printing thousands of books that, about Jesus and about God like that. That's when the people, the, all the minority, before that, I was in China, I was in Korea actually, there, they used to use Chinese because it was difficult to learn, and the poor classes couldn't afford to learn to read it. So they were able to keep the high positions, the high power positions, for themselves, and the lower people couldn't do that. Hangul, the Korean alphabet, is super easy to learn, and that was brought in by the missionaries and the Christians. And it made a great, major, major change in Korea. So, oh yeah, this is about that, this is about that. The Bible says, I will walk in freedom, for I have devoted myself to your commandments. In all kinds of ways, God's principles are bringing freedom to us and everyone around the world who is in contact with, them, with his principles. I'll skip that for now. I think there's a second nation there. But... Okay, I, for we're in mighty now, okay? I am mighty invest in God's people, moral businesses, health and children. Avoid investing in companies that are greedy, okay? Um, one of my friends, Dr. Jack Boyd, he is the president of Adventist Peace. He said, in our world, it's nearly impossible to invest with clean hands, uh, with things like ever, all these stocks and corporations are connected to meat, pornography, gambling, alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, and war, and everything. They're almost all connected. Almost all corporations are owned in some part 
by a few thousand individuals. Most of them are very, very highly anti-Christian. So be careful, be very careful how you invest. A lot of it's connected to really bad and evil things. Um, if you're investing in stocks, I'm saying. Investing in missionaries, in education, in churches is far, far better. Gardening. We talked about that already, Sam. Gardening solves about 25 world problems, and people can make quite, quite a lot of money with it. If, if you study, especially growing microgreens, is very good. Um, so that's very helpful. We talked about that before a little bit. Um, health habits are crucial. If you have good health habits, we double your money by your 50s, we talked about. Uh, truth is life. <laughs> truth sets you free. If you learn truth and follow it, you will be, uh, you'll have better salaries usually, and you'll have, be able to help people have more freedom in different ways. When people pay tithe, they usually have about, about three times benefit back because when you're helping people, people say, ah, oh, that person's a leader, and they often choose you as a leader. So that's very good too. Um, why, if you're mighty there, is Yahweh's church, God's church, is the one to join. Uh, the church that follows God's principles, that's the one to join. And it's very powerful. This is an atheist scientist. He did research, he said, every dollar you give to churches, it produces almost five dollars in benefits to the whole community. Um, in a whole host of ways. Um, he, I think I have a picture here. Oh, I don't, okay. Oh, yeah, there we go. He said churches, um, they stop crime, they reduce divorce, they help others be better and stronger together. They make all kinds of ministries and services. They start schools. So they, they provide, a, they make major, major contributions to communities. It's really powerful. Uh, Jay, for the last word, is Jehovah Justice is the foundation of wise decisions. We want God's wisdom to guide us. That will help us to avoid many, many mistakes. Um, I haven't got pictures on this part, actually, I get actually completely, but um, this is the day that gets you there. Use and borrow things from each other, join the sharing economy, okay? It's a whole big movement happening now, the sharing economy. And it talks about uh, buying from other Christians and moral businesses. And this is based on Bible principles. You can see, um, oh, sh what happened? I, I had it here. Ah. Sorry, I'll, I'll still remember. I thought it was here. But, uh, basically, they said, if you just spend $10 a month on other moral businesses in your, in your community, you can transfer $9.3 billion to local communities nationwide. If each person just bought $10 more locally. And the Bible says, do good first to who? Family. Family, yes, take care of family first, yes, but do good first to the household of faith. <laughs> so if someone in our church has a good business, try to buy from them first, <laughs> okay? And your daily choices of who to buy from, who to buy from make a huge difference in what the church has. I mean, if, uh, if, if, if um, let's just example, you're an atheist, you're a Christian, and I buy from you instead of you, <laughs> it's going to make the Christians have a lot more salary in the month. And then they can give more tithe. And so I found that if, if SDAs buy $100 a month from other SDAs or Christians, we can increase um, the amount of money in our, in our denomination by about $300 million. And then about $30 million will be tied and increase there. So it's really, it's really a simple idea, but very, very powerful. Insurance, uh, try not to buy a whole life insurance. It's not very good. You lose a lot of money that way. Term insurance, I was working with Primark a little bit for a short time, um, but not now. Uh, Christian health insurance, like Medicaid, MediShares, is good also, and that helps some. Land is crucial again. We talked about that many times already. Land is an issue there. Education, God, and also good brain habits is important. That's the E. Environment, try to protect the environment because if you don't have a good environment, no planet. And you have, uh, like, I was in China for a little bit, and the, there's so much pollution there that you can't even breathe sometimes, and then you can't think very well, and then it's hard to make good decisions for good money like that. So that's also a very big issue. And last one is stop debt, uh, live simply, and have confidence in salvation. Because, I think I'm old here somehow. Anyway, C.S. Lewis said, it is those people who think most about heaven that make the biggest difference, difference on this earth. And so having confidence in salvation is a very, very powerful and very important thing to make the, big, the biggest difference in the world. He says the apostles and the Christians who started all the human rights and stopped slavery, they are the ones who believe in heaven and eternal life. But they also believe that you should make a difference in this world because godliness, as my favorite verse says, in 1 Timothy 4, it says, exercise is good, 
that godliness is better because it has benefits for this life and also for eternity. And so Christians are the ones, because they had confidence in the eternal life, they were willing to sacrifice for others. And is that really, that's one of the reasons why they have made the biggest difference in history more than everyone else combined. And so that is the end of my presentation uh, about Jubilee economics and what would Jesus do. Uh, if, you have, if you have any questions, let me know. Or